In the production process, entrepreneurs bring together capital, labor, and land to produce goods and services. To build a skyscraper, cranes and construction workers join forces on a patch of land to create a city in the sky. To make a latte, an espresso machine, a worker known as a barista, and coffee beans intermingle with piping hot water to form a beverage with a jolt of caffeine that we know as coffee. In this module, we'll discuss the costs of production. We'll also explore the decision of how much to produce of anything from big buildings to little shots of espresso. So the key idea that you need to focus on in this module is that firms, meaning businesses, can maximize their profit by producing the quantity that equates marginal revenue and marginal cost. In other words, we know that businesses want to produce the maximum amount of profit. And how do they know what quantity of a good to produce? Well, we will find that is where marginal revenue is actually equal to marginal cost. And we'll discuss what all of those concepts mean. So, for the objectives, first I will explain to you the components of total cost, which we've looked at before in class with the high school food court project. Then, I will identify the condition for profit maximization, which I alluded to in the key idea. And then, I will explain how a profit maximizing entrepreneur decides whether to open a new firm and whether to shut down an existing firm. So, the law of supply tells us that a firm wants to produce and sell more of a good when its price rises. But how much does a firm decide exactly how much to produce and sell? How do they do that? We'll answer that question soon. But our starting point is the relationship between the amount of various inputs a firm uses and its output, which is the amount of a good or service the firm produces. If a coffee shop wants to sell more lattes, it will need to use more inputs. But should it hire more baristas or buy more espresso machines? And how much more of each input should it buy? As you're about to see, that depends on the nature of the inputs themselves and on how much time the firm has to make adjustments. The amounts of some types of inputs can't be adjusted quickly. In Module 13, we discussed how it takes a long time to expand factories and assembly lines. As another example, consider a construction company that wants to expand its business. It can take several months of planning and negotiation before the company can complete the purchase of heavy equipment like cranes and bulldozers. The same is true if a company wants to downsize and sell some of the equipment it already owns. So, over a time period that can last several months or more, the construction company is stuck with the fixed quantity of cranes and bulldozers it happens to have on hand. Economists define this as the short run. And the short run is a period of time and it's not a set period of time, but a period of time during which the quantity of at least one input is fixed. Then there is a period of time that we know as the long run. And when we talk about the long run that we see right here, it's the period of time in which the quantities of all inputs are variable. None of them are fixed. Now, as I said before, there is no set period of time that distinguishes the short run from the long run. This is determined by the amount of time it takes to acquire new inputs in particular industries. If, in the construction industry, the quantities of all inputs could be adjusted in as few as three months, then the short run in that industry is a period of three months. If, in the education industry, it takes two years to add classroom space to a school building, then the short run in that industry is a period of two years. A fixed input is an input like cranes. Or vi Let me go back to the previous slide here. Um, a fixed input is an input like cranes and classroom space, the quantity of which cannot be changed in the short run. This means that the, the quantities of fixed inputs remain the same no matter how much output the firm decides to produce. So that's what we define as a fixed input. And, and the key there is that quantity cannot be changed over that period of time. Now, the amount of a variable input, if we look at, excuse me, let me go back to the, 
go back to the previous one here. I keep jumping ahead. Apologize for that. But if we look at the long run, okay, now we look at the amount of a variable input right here that can be adjusted up or down. So, for example, a construction company can quickly increase or decrease its orders of plywood, cement, or copper pipes. So these are variable inputs. Labor, too, can often be adjusted rapidly. In the construction industry, it might take just a few days to find additional workers. And these workers can be laid off with very short notice if they are not needed. So even in the short run, a construction company's labor and materials are variable inputs. In the short run, as in the long run, firms use more of their variable inputs when they produce more output and less of their variable inputs when they produce less output. In the long run, a firm can adjust the quantities of all its inputs. It can acquire a larger or smaller factory than it has now. It can get new equipment or sell the equipment it has. What were fixed inputs in the short run thus become variable inputs in the long run. That is, in the long run, all inputs are variable. All inputs are variable, and that's key to keep in mind there. Now, sometimes I find that students can get very fixated on a specific length of time that separates the short run from the long run. You want to say, well, is it two days, two weeks, three months? Remember, the long run is whatever length of time is required to change the production capacity. For a lemonade stand, the size of the stand could be expanded in a few days. For a nuclear power plant, it might take years to construct or expand the plant. So the short run and the long run are different depending on the industry. So don't get confused by the terms short run and long run. It boils down to this. In the short run, the quantity of at least one input is fixed. Whereas in the long run, okay, the quantities of all inputs are variable. The inputs with fixed quantities in the short run are what we call fixed inputs. In the long run, even fixed inputs become variable inputs. So now let's turn our attention to a firm's production schedule. A firm's production schedule indicates the inputs needed to produce different quantities of output. So let's look at a production schedule for a fictional lawn mowing company that we'll call Blade Runner Lawn Mowing. Now, the table below contains a production schedule for Blade Runner for a typical week. The table shows that Blade Runner uses two inputs, mowers and workers. Okay. Notice that the number of mowers is fixed at two. So if we look here, you can see that no matter what, how many lawns we mow, we are only using two mowers. So that's our fixed input. So we are looking at Blade Runner's production options in the short run, which in this case is several weeks, because that is the amount of time it would take Blade Runner to acquire more of its fixed input, mowers, or sell the mowers it has. Labor, however, is a variable input. Blade Runner can quickly increase or decrease the quantity of workers it employs. So you can see here that depending on the number of lawns it mows, it can hire a different quantity of workers very, very quickly. Total output, of course, is right here, and it is measured by the quantity of lawns Blade, uh, Blade Runner can mow per day. This is shown in this third column for each number of workers that Blade Runner could employ. So with two employees right there, okay, Blade Runner could mow 12 lawns each day. With three workers, Blade Runner could mow 17 lawns each day. With four workers, it could mow 21 lawns per day, and so on. So the information in Blade Runner's production schedule is also displayed graphically, right here in the, in the graph. The curve on this graph right here is called the production function. Now, if we move rightward on the graph, okay, corresponding to hiring more workers, and then moving upward on the graph, that corresponds to mowing more lawns, 
the upward slope of the production function that we see here, uh, up to a quantity of seven workers, which would be that point right there, shows that more lawns are mowed as each of the first seven workers is hired. Now, what happens when we hire the eighth worker? Well, when the eighth worker is hired, notice the total output decreases from 27 down here to 26. So it's actually going down. The eighth worker causes output to decrease by achieving nothing except getting in the way, as we'll discuss later in the module. So our advice, don't be that eighth worker because you won't be hired. Now, the last column of the production schedule reports the increase in output for each additional worker that's hired. And if we look at the last column, it would be this column right here. And this is going to be very important for us because when we use the word marginal right here, the marginal product of labor, we use the word marginal to mean additional. Okay. So the increase in total output that results from hiring an additional worker is called the marginal product of labor. So if we go back to the previous screen, here is the definition. The marginal product of labor is the amount by which total output increases when one more worker is hired. And remember, marginal always means additional in economics. So going back to the table, we can see here that for each of the first two workers that we hire, right here from zero to two, okay, Blade Runner will increase its marginal product. The marginal product of labor is six, six lawns. Now, how do we know that? Well, when we go from our first lawn, from hiring no workers to hiring one worker, we increase the number of lawns mowed by six, and so that's our marginal product. When we hire the second worker to do this, okay, we produce 12 total lawns, but that's an additional six, so the marginal product is six for the second worker. Okay. So when we look at this, if we follow this last column down, all the way down, okay, what you can see is that after the second worker right here, the second worker is right there, after the second worker, each additional worker has a sm smaller marginal product than the one before. Notice the third worker has a marginal product of five, the next one four, the next one three, the next one two. So marginal product is going down. So the marginal product is five lawns for the third worker, and it's four lawns for the fourth worker, three lawns for the fifth worker, and so on. So let's begin to explore now why it is that marginal product behaves this way. As more and more of a variable input, like labor, is added to the unchanging quantity of a fixed input, like lawnmowers, Congestion and redundancy cause the marginal product of labor to decline. Why? Because Blade Runner has exactly two lawnmowers in the short run. The first and second workers can use a lawnmower full time. The third worker has the disadvantage of having to share a lawnmower with the other two workers. The third worker can mow lawns only while someone else is on break, but might be useful for fetching gasoline and removing rocks and branches from lawns. before they are mowed. So the marginal product of the third worker is substantial at five, but not as high as the marginal product of six for the previous workers. As more workers are added, the mowers are spread even more thinly. More time is spent on breaks or less productive work. Each additional worker contributes less to total output than the worker before because additional workers have less equipment to work with. When the marginal product decreases as the quantity of the variable input increases, we say that there is diminishing marginal productivity. You can also see the effect of diminishing marginal productivity on the graph. As the number of workers increases, 
we see that total output actually continues to rise. Like that. Okay, it's rising. But it rises by less and less with each additional hire. Notice that the slope is getting flatter and flatter. This is why the graph of the production schedule becomes flatter as employment continues to rise. And note that the marginal product does not decrease until the third worker is hired. This point right there. That's where it begins to decrease. There were enough mowers to allow some growth in the number of workers without a decline in marginal productivity. In many situations, the marginal product actually increases as the first few workers are added. Consider a dry cleaning shop in which a single worker must clean and press clothes. This worker will not have time to develop particular skills in either task, but with two workers, each can specialize in a task and get very good at it. Because of the increased skills and focus, marginal product will increase. However, when some inputs are fixed, sooner or later we can expect the other inputs to display diminishing marginal productivity. And so this is what we call the law of diminishing marginal returns. As more of a variable input is used in combination with a fixed input, the marginal product will eventually decrease. It is even possible that past a certain point, additional workers would cause total output to decrease, meaning that marginal product is negative. With too many workers and only two lawnmowers, additional workers won't spend much time mowing lawns. They will just get in the way and distract other workers who would otherwise be productive. This causes total output to decrease. If we look back at this figure, okay, we can see that as Blade Runner expands from seven to eight workers right here, that the marginal product is actually negative. And that is because total output declines from 27 to 26. There would be no reason to hire an eighth worker who causes total output to decline. That would be crazy. Now, let me warn you here. It's very easy to confuse diminishing marginal product with a negative marginal product, but they are very different. They're not the same thing. When marginal product is decreasing, as it is right here, it's going down, okay, but it's still positive. Those are still positive numbers. Hiring additional workers causes total output to continue going up or rising, but marginal product is still diminishing because the number is getting smaller. But when marginal product is negative, as it is right here, okay, employing more workers actually causes the total output that we see right there to fall. Above that point, total output continues to rise, even though marginal product is declining.